it forces you to really look and ask the question. I go a long way to ask, what has God called you to do? Mm. Uh, ultimately, what has he called you to do? Okay, welcome back to the Blueprint Podcast Series. Today, uh, we have somebody who I refer to as as the GOAT. Uh, somebody who, when I started this podcast, was the first person I, I thought of uh, because, number one, he's a great storyteller. And number two, uh, he's just a good good dude, man. And so uh, I can read off uh, all his accomplishments, uh, but somebody, a wise man once told me, uh, if somebody needs a long introduction, they probably don't need one at all. <laughs> so, uh, so without further ado, uh, the GOAT himself, T. Dallas Smith. How you doing, man? Man, I'm good. Juwan, thanks, man, for having me on the Blueprint. I appreciate it, bro. Uh, no problem. No problem. Thanks for uh, for hopping on. Uh, and I just want to hop right into it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've heard your story plenty of times, so I'm going to yeah. try not to interrupt you on some things but uh yeah i probably could tell better, better than you at this point <laughs> you might have to one day <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh just hop right in uh just yeah. tell, tell me about your upbringing you know you're from yeah. uh tell me what, what what that was like yeah man well you know uh pe- people have heard me say this a long time and, I, and and this is not my saying so i have to always give credit to rafa from ben hill but rafa ben hill at a talk show uh Became a talk show host from being a caller. Mm. So it was a hell of a hell of a story. Yeah. But his tagline was always Atlanta born, Atlanta bred. When I die, I'll be Atlanta dead. So yeah. I was like, absolutely. So I'm from Atlanta. Grew up in Hunter Hills, mm. a community right off of um, what is now MLK. It used to be Hunter Hunter Street back in the day, okay. uh, bordered on by Simpson Road on the other side, which is now Donnelly Hollowell. So okay. not Donnelly Hollowell, Joseph B. Boom. Okay. In my head, it's still Simpson Road. It will always be Simpson Road. That's okay. Cool. I grew up on Child's Drive, Simpson Road, 200 Child's Drive to be exact. Uh, uh, the community was paradise. Everybody yeah. looked out for one another. Wow. It was what I would describe now. We didn't know this what it was, but mm-hmm. we put into terms everything these days. Yeah. But it was basically a mixed income community. Wow. If you think about it. Yeah. Because back then, you know, you had segregation, mm-hmm. all that very strong. And mm-hmm. So all blacks, I mean, we had to live together, but it yeah. was. Hunter Street was our West Paces Ferry. Wow. I mean, it was the richest of the rich black folk lived on Hunter Street, Damn. which is now MLK. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so when you think about Hank Aaron lived on Hunter Street, yeah. uh, uh, TM Alexander lived on Hunter Street, who was a big real estate guy, a lot of the lawyers, judges. I mean, it was, it was, it was a Hunter Street. Damn. And uh, as a matter of fact, my wife and I, I'm moving back to Hunter, uh, okay. Hunter Hills, okay. because um, I just feel it incumbent that mm-hmm. if we're really going to change our trajectory in our for our communities, yeah. I don't think it's going to happen until Black folks who can afford to live anywhere on the planet move choose to move back into our communities. Right. right. Uh, if we're not putting value in our real estate in our communities, why should we expect anybody else to put value in our? Right, right. All right, but anyway, let me get off that soapbox. Um, <laughs> Man, we can talk all day about that. Uh, yeah, you know, I just you know, <laughs> we, I've said you know, instead of instead of Buckhead, look at Bankhead. Okay, yeah. <laughs> right. This, you know, that's um, we we'll leave it right there. Right, right. But um, the, I mean, the reality, I man, I had a great, great upbringing. Um, mm-hmm. Two sisters, mom and dad, who uh, house full of love. Everybody, you know. My dad was a man's man. He was uh, a military guy, 82nd Airborne, wow. a paratrooper uh, who didn't take no take no mess. Yeah. <laughs> he was a very uh, pragmatic man. My mom was the entrepreneur of the family. Wow. Uh, she had uh, she kept kids at the house, so she had a daycare at the house. And what was so funny to me, I never saw her as an entrepreneur because she so loved children. Mm. I mean, it was she's hardwired to love kids. I mean, that's yeah. That's how that's who she was. So it never looked like she was working. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. she was having fun with these kids. In my head, she was having fun with these kids. These kids yeah. come and play with her, <laughs> doing that kind of thing. But uh, she just she had a heart for kids. And but 
it was my mother who really got me on the entrepreneur uh, track. And, and I, I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, I was yeah. watching, uh, I was doing, you know, I do my research. Uh, for yeah, yeah. And then also I watched this, uh, I don't know if you watched it, but Kanye West has a documentary that came out. Um, and, and it's a clip in there with him and his mom and his mom passed yeah. away. Yeah. Um, but you have a similar, and I resonate with this too. My mom was played a pivotal, still does play a pivotal role yeah. in my life. But so nice. can you tell the story about uh, when your mom, the impact your mom played, but then uh, the specific story about your nose? Okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got a good memory. You, you, you may be able to tell a story better. Than me. So, that's that's you absolutely right. So my mom was my biggest fan on the planet. Period. Mm -hmm. Um, I grew up, you know, Hunter Hill, went to East Clement Elementary School. Uh, the kids could be, you know, real cruel. And I, I was always a very skinny kid. And the si same size nose I have now, I had when I was two. You know, I was like, so. <laughs> so I remember coming home one day crying. And I was like, Mom, they, you know, they said I got a big nose. And my mom stopped in her tracks. She was washing dishes. She looked at me and she said, son, you have the nose of a king. Mm. And she went back to washing her dishes. Mm. And I remember running to the bathroom, looking at my face, going, oh, man, that, is that, that's what that is. That's a, that's a nose of a kid, you know. <laughs> and I went back the next day, and kids started trying to talk trash again. And I was like, hey, man, this is a nose of a king. <laughs> you wouldn't know anything about it because you have no royalty in your blood. <laughs> I, was like, I was a little kid just going off, man. Right. Always had a mouthpiece. So, But that just that little thing that my mother did, really mm -hmm. empowered me. Mm -hmm. And in that like that same vein, uh Duan, she was, this is like a different day. We were we were always in the kitchen for some reason. She was <laughs> watching dishes and I you know, I think she just kept me close. Uh -huh. And uh my nickname growing up was Ty. Everybody called me Ty, T Y. Because my, my first name is Tanalo. So yeah. <laughs> and I'll get to that. But um but everybody in the hood called me Ty. So right. it's just T Y Ty. Uh -huh. And um and so one day, you know, she's washing dishes and she just stops again, like, Ty, you ought to go ask the Flanagans if you can cut that grass. Mm. And I said, and, th and this is when I look back at it now at 59 year old uh. man, soon to be Lord willing, uh, 60 in August. This was the only question I asked my mom. And this is what <laughs> this is what tells me, do I was an entrepreneur uh. through and through. I'm hardwired that way. Yeah. The only question I asked her was, how much should I charge? I didn't, I didn't say, why? I don't feel like I didn't do nothing. I said, why? How much should I charge? She said, $5. I said, $5. Man, I ran next door to the Flanagan's like, like the house was on fire. You know, they like, answered the door and they were an older couple. And uh, they said, uh, Ty, what's, what's wrong? What's wrong? I said, Mr. Flanagan, can I, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I cut your grass? And they just <laughs> smiled. They said, Sure, Ty. How much you can charge? I said five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> he reached over, man, and grabbed. And I'm show you this. Uh -huh. I still have. Oh, you still got it. That's the very first silver dollar I ever earned. Man. First dollar I ever earned was from cutting the grass at the Flanagan. Wow. And this this hangs on my wall in my office. Wow. For 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 a simple reason to never forget yeah. where you come from. Wow. You know, always appreciate. Um, you know, the things that happen, man, that, that you know, the, the Bible says, mm -hmm. do not despise your humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. But God uh, delights in you trying. Mm -hmm. wow. Right. So yeah. we got a. So, I, I mean, I got a picture of me. My steak and shake was my first yeah. real job where I got a W-2. <laughs> wow. I was washing dishes, you know, uh, that's on the wall right next to the silver dollar. Uh -huh. uh, and then, you know, then I have the realtor of the year. <laughs> Uh, the Alvin B. Case Award on the wall, pictures of me and Spike Lee, pictures of me and the governor. Next to that steak and shake, is the $5, I mean, the $1, uh, silver dollar. So for me, it's the whole spectrum yeah. of who you are. I mean, you're good, bad. I mean, all the stuff that's made you, right? Yeah, right. To embrace all of that, man. But it was hardwired. And I had that business, man. Me and my cousin, my cousin was... I was too little. This uh, the part about cutting the grass. So I come back and tell my mom I got these silver dollars. Yeah. My mom says, "Well, I guess you got to cut the grass now." I said, <laughs> I, you know, I, I was 
too little to crank no more, but I could pull and I could push the more. Uh-huh. And so my mom comes out full moo moo, scar, yeah. everything, man, cranks no more for me. <laughs> <laughs> I go cut the grass for the Flanagan. Yeah. But I knew that wasn't a sustainable model. <laughs> right. and my mom was coming out to crank no more for me all the time. Right. So my cousin, Eric Melson, who was, he, he was taller than me, uh, uh-huh. year older than me, but he was, he was taller than me too, and he could crank the more. So I called him. Yeah. So I guess it's my my first business, uh, as he say. He says I, he was my first employee, but that's my, <laughs> it's my first joint venture. You know, I told my cousin, I said, "Man, hey, man, if you know, I, I got, I can, I get the business, but uh-huh. I'm gonna need help cranking the more." Right. He, I know you can crank it. He said, "Yeah, all right." So, and we split the we split the little five dollars, <laughs> and then we start cutting other people's yards, man. And uh, but I mean, that was really that was I'm eight years old. Yeah, as an entrepreneur, what I loved about it was it was really based on what I did. Mm. If I wanted to earn income, right, I wasn't dependent on anybody else. Yeah, it was like I had this whole thing in my head because I wanted a go kart. Uh. <laughs> I figured I could get a go kart, you know, in three months. You know, based if I cut that grass like every other day or something. Right? <laughs> I didn't realize grass didn't grow every other day. Right. <laughs> I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't you know, plan in rain and. You know, uh-huh. all this stuff, winter, I didn't, I didn't plan. So my mother helped me think through that. Uh-huh. I was like, I was disappointed. Like, oh, man, this, at this rate, you know, this one house. Right. And my mother said, you can always get more customers. Mm. I was like, I mean, I'm eight. Dude. So it's like, man, why, why? you know, like, oh, is that possible? You can do that? So that's what I started doing, man. Yeah. And I cut grass from age eight to till t- I was 21. Man, man. Yeah. To 21. I was 21. And, I, and mind you, yeah. I got in the real estate business at 19. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> so 19, 20, 21, I was cutting grass. On the weekends, I was cutting grass, but still, yeah. you know, because I had to put gas in the car and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I'm working in a straight commission business. Right. Dude, I, but I knew how to hustle, man. Yeah. Uh, got paid uh, cash money and yeah. kept it moving, you know. Man, so so staying on that, on that track, uh, it was a, a time where you kind of – Put your you landed on real estate. Uh, this idea, and again, I don't want to tell the story, but uh, when, when you were looking, you you had to go. He's like, "Hey, I just want to make money." Yeah. Um, so can you talk about that a little bit? What led yeah. you to you know start thinking about real estate? So I had to backtrack. So when I was fourteen, we moved. We left the city of Atlanta. Mm-hmm. We moved to College Park. Okay. I was angry at my parents, man. I was yeah. like, dude, you know, my two older sisters got to graduate from Turner High School, went to Turner High. And my two sisters were, were gorgeous girls. Mm-hmm. So all the dudes in the hood was looking out for me. Oh, yeah. and mind you, at the time, I didn't understand. Yeah, right. I just thought, man, everybody, everybody liked me. Man, I, yeah, I'll video you that. Yeah, everybody loving me, man. Yeah. But I realized as a grown person, they were trying to get to my sisters. Right. <laughs> so, so the big the big dudes in the neighborhood, the bullies, everybody, they okay. they started looking out for me, man. Nobody. Yeah. So and then here we are at 14, having to leave, you know, the entire my sisters have done all the work where yeah. I, I could just say their name and I was getting in place. <laughs> all that went to, to to the to the wayside when we moved to College Park. In uh-huh. fact, the, the thing I mentioned, too, that was the first day I ever dealt with anything racial, too, because I never I grew up in an all race uh, black neighborhood, yeah. never dealt with anything racial ever. Yeah, ever. I mean, we I mean, back then we weren't even calling each other the N word. That, that, yeah. We weren't even doing that to each other. So so back then, was College Park considered like the suburbs or like College Park was as, as white as Alpharetta? Wow. I mean, it, was, it was we were the first black family on our street, man. Yeah, yeah. It was, in fact, when we moved in, the family across the street came out. Um, Husband, uh, mother, you know, (laughs) I mean, husband, wife, son, daughter, and a golden retriever. They waited till we turned around uh, and they put a for sale sign in the yard and stormed back into the house. Oh, man. And I said to my dad, I said, Dad, that's ironic. I said, you know, we're moving in and they're moving out. <laughs> my, my dad was like, boy, get in the house. You know, like <laughs> my parents knew what was going on. But, I, didn't, you know, again, I had never experienced anything racist. So I literally at 14, I never I didn't know what was going on. I did. I just thought it was. Oh, that's ironic. Man. And um, I rode my bike again. I'm still clueless to what was going on. Yeah. Um, 15 minutes later, I told my dad, I'm going to ride my bike in this new neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I mean, again, I was clueless. Uh, 
uh, I didn't get it. I didn't get all the way around the block. Yeah. And these, uh, this car pulls up to me and there's three young white boys in the car. Windows go down slow. Yeah. And they said, get out of my neighborhood, nigga. Dang. And they start throwing rocks and cans at me. Dang. And even then, I'm thinking to myself, dude, y'all got the wrong dude. I mean, it's not because in my neighborhood where I was from, uh-huh. if some beef popped off, it was because somebody did something to somebody. Right. Just showing up. I'm like, <laughs> how you get in trouble for showing up? I mean, right. I, all I'm doing is riding a bicycle. I mean, what, what, what is the offense there? I mean, how do you understand what's going on? I mean, like my 14-year-old brain could not comprehend what was happening. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, they started throwing more stuff at me. Man, I just, I got, you know, I started just pedaling. Mm-hmm. I just seen out of Forrest Gump, except I wasn't running. I was on my bike rolling. <laughs> and... Um, got back to my parents' house, we had a little carport, mm-hmm. and I jumped off the bike with a car, the bike that slid to the carport. Uh-huh. Right? Cause I'm still, I'm full, I'm, at this point, I'm jumping off and running full speed. <laughs> still trying to comprehend what just happened to me. Yeah. And, but I walk into this house mm-hmm. and it's an idyllic Norman Rockwell painting yeah. scene, you know. My mom and my sisters are hanging curtains. Uh, my dad's painting a corner. I mean, I, my mom's the happiest I've ever seen her in her life. Yeah. And at 14, I decided that I was not going to tell my parents what just happened. Mm. Mm. Because I felt like if I told them what just happened, I was going to ruin their perfect day. Wow. And so yeah. the way I describe it is that was my first razor blade I had to swallow. Mm. You know, it was painful, but it's like, let me remain silent. Yeah. So my mom was like, boy, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? And I was like, nothing. What's wrong? You know, your parents know when something's right. wrong with their kid. Yeah. But to, I mean, I've never, my mom died 2020, my dad died 2010. I never told them the story. Man. In fact, my sisters only know the story now is because I'm writing a book mm. and the story is in the book. Right. And, and my sister's like, I didn't know this happened. And so that's just funny to them. I just, I felt like I would have been like the one ruining everybody's day. Yeah. And uh, so I didn't. Man. And so I, I it just, I, I, didn't, uh, I got a crash course in <laughs> racism. You know, it's like to go yeah. from zero to a hundred. I mean, I literally had not experienced anything like that. Yeah. But, uh, but you asked how I got to the real estate piece. Yeah. So now I'm at Lakeshore High School in College mm-hmm. Park. And I meet these, I mean, it's less than 5% black folks at the, at the high school. I mean, so it's, you know, yeah. This is, yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. This is my uh, my freshman year mm-hmm. there. Because back then, it, I'm so old, you know, we didn't, we didn't have middle school. We just had elementary school and high school. <laughs> so elementary went up to seventh grade and high school went from eight to 12. So oh, I was in the ninth grade. Yeah. Eighth grade, you were a sub-freshman. Ninth grade, you were a freshman. I, mean, I ain't gonna lie, that, that'd be a long time ago. You never, you never heard that, right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's how it was. So, but I'm at the school, man. I meet these two young brothers, man. Uh, they were actually two black guys who were actually brothers. One's 14, one's 13. Troy Givens and Stacy Givens. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I'm glad to see them. They're glad to see me. They were like, man, y'all to come by the house. And they showed me where they live, told me where they live. So I, I walked over like maybe the next day or so to visit them. Thinking we're gonna, you know, go over there and play some basketball or something, just kind of hang out. Mm-hmm. Juwan, I walk in on these cats, man, and they're having a full blown conversation. Yeah. Stacy is the older brother. He's telling Troy, the younger brother, mm-hmm. and this is the this is the conversation. Yeah. Uh, no, man, you you won't be able to afford a, a, nine, a, a Porsche nine eleven. Then you'll <laughs> just you'll just be in your residency. You won't be able. To, they have to do it. I'm like, <laughs> so while they're in the middle of this conversation, I'm looking at their room. Yeah. They share the room, twin beds on both sides. Mm. And what we would call now a um, a vision board right. is what they had on both sides. Mm. But at the time, I had never seen anything like that. Because right. Right? on my wall, all I had was Dr. J and Shaka Khan. <laughs> <laughs> but they got both Morehouse pennants. They both going to go to Morehouse. They got the grad schools they're going to. One's going to be a uh, anesthesiologist, the other's going to be a dentist. The, the, the anesthesiologist was also going to go into the Air Force. They had pictures of their the cars they're going to have, the house, or the timelines on both sides. I mean, they hey. their entire lives were yeah. mapped out at 13 to 14 years old. Hey. 
So I remember leaving their house thinking to myself, shit, Ty, you gotta get your shit. You gotta get your shit together, man. You, dude, you a loser, bro. You you been here 14 years and you don't know, you don't know what you wanna be. You I mean, I was, like, I was having this whole conversation with myself, like, dude, I mean, I mean, I looked at these cats like, oh man, like I had never but their dad also was the one who put them on this track that, you know, and then their sister ended up being a lawyer as well. I mean, they, they, wow. <laughs> this is what they were going to do. Yeah. And so, but I, I never had anybody press me like that in my yeah. family. In fact, if I would just, if I had just worked at the post office, yeah. good benefits, good job, yeah, good exactly. school, my parents would have been happy. <laughs> you right. know what I'm saying? My dad would have been ecstatic. Yeah. <laughs> no child got good family. He got good federal benefits. Good you know, benefits. Oh, yeah, he would have, dude, that would have made his life right yeah. but so seriously so now i move forward that's 14 uh, but i don't get into real estate till i'm 19 so in my head i'm five years late oh, wow. i'm a late bloomer uh, you know, i'm a yeah. late bloomer but it's funny now how everybody said why you get this so early i was like dude, i was in my head i was five years late because these guys, right? and uh and the re reason how that happened i took a uh, didn't know really what i wanted to do in life the only thing I kept coming up with is I wanted to make a lot of money. That was mm -hmm. a common thing. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> this one particular uh, day, I just said, man, you know what? Forbes magazine. Forbes magazine had just come out with the richest 400 people list mm -hmm. in 1982. Mm -hmm. and so I took the magazine and I literally by hand, I studied all 400 of them. And so I ended up, ended up categorizing them. So like you have T Boone Pickens, mm. old man out of Texas, mm. his net worth, um, Donald Trump, when he was just a real estate guy, <laughs> Donald Trump, real estate, New York city, his net worth, uh, Warren Buffett, you know, investor, uh, Omaha, Nebraska, his net worth. So I did this with everybody. I had, so I ended up with these stacks, mm. which was really just categories of what the richest people did. Right. And as I said earlier, I'm, you know, Atlanta born, Atlanta bred. When I died, I'm Atlanta dead. So I wanted yeah. to stay in Atlanta. I didn't want to leave Atlanta. Yeah. So if you did oil, you needed to go to Texas. If you did investments, you need to be in New York or Chicago. Um, technology was just not my thing. It was like the, just the, sort of the beginning of the technology move. Yeah. And then it was real estate was the fourth thing. Mm. Well, I didn't want to work on weekends. So yeah. that knocked out residential because yeah. I, you know, I wasn't going to, I didn't want to put people in my car, drive around. <laughs> and so what I ended up doing is just um, I figured, okay, there's this thing called commercial estate where mm -hmm. people represent buildings like the ones you see behind me or the tenants who move into them. You know, it's, it's all of that. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know anybody in commercial real estate. My sister who was dating Michael Hightower at the time. Yeah. Michael Hightower, I don't know if you know Mike, but Mike was a city councilman. Uh, in College Park at the time. In fact, I think Mike was the youngest city councilman in the United States at the time. Dang. So in my head, he was the most influential person I knew. Right. So this, I thank God for common sense. In yeah. my head, I should talk to the most influential person yeah. I know. Right. See who he know. Yes. Yeah. See who he knows and just try to connect the dots. And this yeah. is, I didn't talk to anybody. This is uh, just, this is God giving common sense. Yeah. Uh, if you met my mom, you get, my mom was very yeah. much a common sense person. Uh, uh and that's what I did. So I called Mike. He knew somebody. Mm -hmm. And the, the company was called Colmer Properties off Virginia Avenue near the airport. And uh, Bill Colmer, he he, uh, he said, hey, I'll set you up with somebody in my shop. You can chat. It might not be me, but uh, we'll work it out. So he mm -hmm. worked it out. Where I was able to shadow this guy by the name of Steve Gautney. Steve mm -hmm. Gautney was a broker then doing a lot of retail stuff at the time. Mm -hmm. Like I, if I, if I, if, if I don't, unless I say they're black, yeah. just assume everybody in my story is white. All right. All right. <laughs> this, this, is, this industry is still just less than 3% black folk. Now, mind you, in 1982, it was, it was oh. probably less than 1%. So, <laughs> so if, if, if I don't say the race, just assume they're white. Okay. Right. I should throw that out there. All right. All right. <laughs> that's, just, that's just what it is, right? right. Um, and so, Steve got me, but nice guy. He said, Hey man, he was dri driving me around. He said, yeah, I had, a, you know, that was an acquisition I did for somebody. That was a disposition I did over there. That, he's using these words I'd never heard before. Yeah. So I felt like I was drinking from fire hose, so just trying to keep up with this guy. And then he said, but I'm going to take you to this meeting. And when you're in a meeting, just, you know, just sit, be quiet. But afterwards you can ask me questions. Mm -hmm. Sure. So after the meeting, I mean, we go into the meetings, him and this other guy on the other side, 
And they start off kind of stoic, you know, one another. Uh, the body language was like, we're not agreeing to this. And then it went from agreeing to, okay, we got something. They shook hands, smiled, we left. Mm. Okay. That's, that was what I took from it. What they were really talking about, I can tell you. Yeah. I just watched the body language. Uh-huh. And uh, so Steve says, to, well, Dallas, do you have any questions? I said, well, yeah. Um, it looks like it's kind of starting off a little, a little slow. A little. He said, yeah, that happens from time to time. But it seems, I said, it seems like you came to an agreement. He said, we did. Yeah. I said, I just have one question. He said, what's that? I said, well, how much money are you going to make? <laughs> he, said, he laughed. He said, he said Dallas, this is 1982. Uh-huh. When a median income for a family of four was $28,000. Man. Steve said, Dallas, I'll make $30,000 off that transaction. And I thought to myself, yes, <laughs> this, this is it. Yeah. Yeah, I can do that. What I just saw him do, yeah, I can, that I can do. I can do that. So yeah. Steve was like, you know, Dallas, we're a small firm. We really don't have room to hire anybody, but let me take you to lunch. So he took me to lunch. And while I was there, he introduced me to this guy named Tom Thompson. Mm-hmm. By this time, I'm at Georgia State. Tom's also at Georgia State. We're both um, – sophomores at, at Georgia State yeah. and uh, just a nice guy you know nice again with the same age everything mm-hmm. again the only difference is he was white I was black I mean, right. but really nice guy yeah. and I told him what I was trying to do yeah. a couple of days later he called me he said Dallas hey I met somebody he's looking to hire somebody in the real estate business mm-hmm. I said yeah he said yeah I said well, what's his name he says his name is Thomas W. Tift yeah. Jr. Mm-hmm. I said, Tift. I said, T-I-F-T. He said, yeah. I said, like, like Tifton, like the city of Tiff, like yeah. Tiff University. <laughs> he said, yes, one and the same. <laughs> said, okay. But the Tiff family owned a ton of real estate near the airport. Mm-hmm. And they still had 80 acres left. And there they had office space, industrial space, retail space, and raw land. Mm-hmm. And he was looking for somebody to come and represent them. Right. Uh, so in my head, again, I mentioned to you, my first name is Tanalo. Yeah. My last name is Smith. So I don't, I don't have a middle name. I don't have any nigga. I mean, other than Ty, and Ty wasn't gonna cut it. Right. Most people thought Ty was Tyrone. So right. anybody, you know, so I, I hated being called Tyrone. Right. No disrespect to anybody other than named Tyrone, but I just, <laughs> just in my in my neighborhood, the hoodie right. students in my neighborhood were all Tyrone. Tyrone, right? that's a fact. Right. Yeah. They were the bullies. They were, I mean, the, the trouble. Everybody was tired. And I just, in my head, I didn't want to be associated with that. But anyway, no, again, no disrespect. I apologize to every Tyrone that hears this. But, um, I, you know, I knew Tyrone wasn't going to work. I didn't, out of the 400 richest people on the list, I ain't seen nobody named Tyrone. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I, <laughs> you know, that's just fine. <laughs> I, you know, I'm simple, man. I'm like, hey, dude. All right. All right. Right. It's, 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 it is what it is. Man. So right. my, and my name is actually a Filipino name. My dad <laughs> named me after his friend uh-huh. in the service. Uh-huh. And I'm I'm growing up in the hood with damn Tanalo. I'm like, dude. And the, everybody butchered my name, teachers, everybody. Yeah, it's right. like Tony Alo. So it's not uh-huh. even, it's not how it's pronounced. But yeah. anyway, I, I knew Tanalo Smith wasn't going to cut it. Mm-hmm. I knew Tanalo Smith on the resume going to Mr. Tiff was going to go to straight to file 13. Right. And so <laughs> I said, okay, we got to work on this. So I, yeah. now again, this turns for all this stuff I'm telling you yeah. now, but it worked terms in just like the uh, vision board. That, yeah. that, that, that wasn't nothing. Then, yeah. I mean, these guys are ahead of curve. Yeah. What I'm telling you now is there's a term now called whitewashing your resume. Mm, yeah. That wasn't a the thing then. I just, this is just the amount of a 19 year old and I knew what I needed to do if I was going to get this job. Wow. So, you know, I, I ran track, played basketball, mm-hmm. all these black sports, right? Mm-hmm. I said, no, that ain't going to work. <laughs> so I put, I had golf on my resume. <laughs> yes, you know, squash, <laughs> the whitest white things that I could think of. Oh, my collective yeah. was on that resume. Yeah. <laughs> And um, but I still had this issue of this name, Tanalo yeah. Smith. Yeah. Now, when I was in high school, I had I was head of the uh, photographers, mm-hmm. for the yearbook staff. Yeah. And what that meant was it, it was my responsibility to make sure everybody got film. Mm-hmm. Uh, they gave assignments to like you know five different photographers. Okay, 
Uh, Juwan, you're going to work uh, the crowd today on the visitor side. You know, Anthony's you work you're working on the home side. Uh, you're working the cheerleaders. You're yeah. working the offensive team. You're working so every I would get assignments and. Mm-hmm. At the end of the night, we get out everybody's film. This is back in the day when film had to be developed. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't digital. This is it. So what happened was this was really the very – this was the genesis of the name Dallas. Yeah. So if um, Kodak was the film company, mm-hmm. and I'm all of 16 years old, yeah. and I'm over the photographers. <laughs> our film's not there yet. You know, it's 4 o'clock. Game. I mean, we were going to be playing game pretty soon. Um, I needed to film there by four, by four o'clock. Right. And so I pick up the phone. I call this guy. And my, now, mind you, this guy's a grown man who I'm calling, <laughs> talking to. So, I, and I'm and I'm reading him the riot act. Uh-huh. You know, you late? Where are you? I mean, if you, if you don't have it here in the next thirty minutes, bro, cancel our contract because uh-huh. Fuji was coming to town. So I said, uh-huh. I was, the Fuji reps been calling me. I hadn't been taking the calls because I'm trying to t- work with you. Uh-huh. I'm telling you right now, if you don't have this here. We're going to Fuji. Yeah. Boom, I hang up the phone. <laughs> and there's a woman who was in my class who was also on one of the yearbook photographers. Her name is Sean Mitchell. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sean probably doesn't even remember this happened, but it, it meant a lot to me. Uh, and she goes, damn. She said, damn. She said, no, she said, damn, Tanalo. Uh, you, you sound like JR on that phone. Now, JR was the, the bad guy in the TV show. Damn. Yeah, right, right. And so, you know, all, you know, arrogant 16 year old. Yeah. Uh, I said, Sean, JR ain't got shit on me. I said, <laughs> anything, you call me Dallas because I'm right. bad in the whole damn show. And so <laughs> it really became a joke just between the two of us. Yeah. That, that I was Dallas. Yeah. So then I go off to Tennessee State, uh-huh. and now I'm at Tennessee State my freshman year. And my buddy who I'd gone to Lakeshore with, um, Chakaris Moss, we're up on, we're in the, on the yard now at Tennessee State. Mm-hmm. And uh, my parent, parents had just dropped us off. And, and he said, hey, Ty, man, let's, let's go over and get something to eat. I said, Chuck, I said, man, don't call me Ty, man. I said, call me Dallas. <laughs> Chuck didn't skip a beat. He said, all right, Dallas, let's go get something to eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and literally from that point on, I, you know, right. I came down. So this Makes is next yeah. thing, right? Yeah. So you know, <laughs> I, I, eighty-two. I'm having this interview. And yeah. So the name I ended up having was T. Dallas. Man. So, so even stopping there, like, so, so like you said, the term now might be might might be whitewashing or um, yeah. or whatever. But have you did you ever get any like backlash or even as you? And we probably talk about this a little later, but even as you got into the business, yeah. you know, especially us, a lot of times we say, "Oh, he's selling out," or he's, you know, he's with all them white folks. Or did you get any of that? And if so, how did you deal with that? Man, you know? it wasn't no black folks in my industry. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. They were, if, if anybody I got the flat from was my mom and my dad. Like, right, right. We ain't name you no damn Dallas. That ain't yeah. your name. What the so you know, I was like, but so it was painful for them to say. Yeah. Everybody start calling me Dallas. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, my mortgage, my credit cards, yeah. my bank accounts all say T. Dallas Smith <laughs> now. Right. Uh, because I, as I was explaining, somebody asked me that same question at, at, at Georgia State when I was, when I was speaking at the school. Yeah. Did you ever think about just going back to your real name? I said, dude, I earned that fucking name. <laughs> I said, I earned that name. Yeah. Okay. I, put, I put in the work for that name. Yeah. I, I said, you know, that's Tanalo yeah. and that's Dallas. Those, right. are, those are like Dallas is the businessman. Right, right, right. I mean, that's who he is. I mean, he, uh, he he was invented, created to do business. Man. Made to do business. Right. And so I was like, I've earned that. You know, Tanalo is the friendly artistic. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I was the artist. I was um, yeah. very creative in school and mm. kind of wind down kind of guy. So right. they're, they're, they're two distinct people. Mm-hmm. And so I'm very, I'm very clear on uh, that. But I, you know, hell, man, I earned that name. Right, right. right. I can do. I, blood, sweat, and tears paid for that name. All right, <laughs> it has so, paid you too. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 it, it worked out. You know what I'm saying? But this is this is the this is the mind of a 19 year old man. Right, right. So I, you know, I, I so thank God for common sense. Yeah, yeah. And for His Word, man. As, mm-hmm. as much as I cuss and all that kind of stuff, yeah. I'm. I'm <laughs> I'm a Christian, you know. The one thing about God, He knows His children. You know, He knows He knows how I'm wired. Yeah. You know, yeah. He had a keep again. That's just that's Dallas. Yeah. But um, 
Yeah, man, I, I have not looked back. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, the thing about hate is going to hate, bro. Yeah. One, one thing you got to understand, <laughs> hate is going to hate. Right, that's a fact. But you don't have no haters, man. It, I guarantee you, you ain't doing, you're not doing nothing. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it comes with the territory, man. Mm -hmm. It just does. It's unfortunate, yeah. but yeah. it just comes with the territory. Mm -hmm. I often see people who really have issues. It's not so much an issue with you, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Them, it's yeah. really an issue with themselves. Mm -hmm. And you remind them of the very thing that they say couldn't be done or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, hell, you're doing it. Right. So it then begs the question, well, well, hell, if that guy can do it, well, hell, I know I can too. Right, right. So that's the approach I've always taken. I've yeah. never, you know, I, I put it this way, man. Uh, God called Noah to mm -hmm. build an ark, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. He didn't ask nobody else in the Bible to build an ark. He asked one dude to build an ark. Yeah. Yeah. That dude built the ark, right? Yeah. Laid the planet, right? So, but if I was a hater, mm -hmm. and I'm sure, I like to think that I just do <laughs> That's all this time. I used to do a whole routine around this, uh -huh. this stuff, right? And the subject was simply this, man. I know in my neighborhood, if, if Noah had started building a damn ark in my neighborhood, <laughs> in my neighborhood, boy, we'd have talked much trash about it. Like, you know, if you remember the story in the Bible, where Noah was building an ark, it had never rained before. Right. So water, it was like irrigation, like water would come from the ground, the springs, right. and all that kind of stuff. That's how they but it didn't rain. Right. So here you are building a a, a boat the size of a football field <laughs> in a place where it's never rained before. I know I would have been talking trash. Yeah. Trash, trash. So I know I would have been. Man, what the hell are you doing? I, I know I would have been that dude. Yeah. I know. <laughs> but I like to think, Juwan, when I started seeing animals come two by two, right, right, <laughs> at that point, I like to think I would have said, "Yeah, hey, you know, no, you know, I've been tripping, dude. Right, I, I know I've been tripping. You know, uh, right. I just saw the two polar bears <laughs> coming to the desert. <laughs> right, right. You know, I just saw, I just saw two giraffes. Yeah. I, just saw, I, I saw all these animals walk in together. Nobody attacked each other. They just right. walked in like a. Right. Like, I said, "You got, you know, something going on." So, right. hey. I want to propose this to you. Yeah. Um, how about I ride with you? Right. Um, <laughs> you're going to need somebody to help get all this shit off the boat. <laughs> I'll be your guy. You know, I, all I ask for is, you know, some food and uh, some good shovels. But, right. Right. And I roll with you. I right. mean, that, that's how I like to think. I, yeah. In my head, that's what I would have done. Exactly. You're right. <laughs> and so, <laughs> some people, you know, yeah. Then you got the other guys like, man, you know, Noah building this boat saying it's about to flood. Uh, you see the opportunists. Mm -hmm. You know what, man? I'm going to build a boat too, bro. Right. But yeah, I ain't bringing animals. I, all y'all can come, but you know, I'm going to charge you two rubies, <laughs> three rubies here. You know, I, this is a this is a cast venture for me. Right. Uh, and I start building my ark the same uh -huh. way Noah's building his ark. Right. And Noah, Noah just laughed because Noah know damn well. God spoke yeah, to him. Right. Now they tell you to do that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm just seeing you. I'm, I want to run your race. Right. I'm, I'm going to run your race. I mean, right. you, you're doing well. You, I'm, I'm going to do the same thing. You do. And right. you got a lot of people who do that too. Mm. And I'm convinced that even if you did that, got the boat going and you take it off, your boat's crashing. You're not going to make it. You so go it forces it. you to really look and ask the question. I'm mm. going a long way to ask mm. what has God called you to do? Mm. Uh, ultimately, what has he called you to do? Mm. And if you look into, it's a, there's a core, there was a study done, I can't remember who did it, but the study was around when you look, it was, it was, it was, it was the, the premise of the book was mm. looking for your calling, mm. right? And it was somewhere between the ages of eight and 12 mm. was the answer. So if you go and see what you really love to do when you were eight to 12 years old, mm. your future is somewhere tied in there. Mm. They don't ask me why that age was, but mm. as I mentioned, at eight was I became an entrepreneur. Mm. So that was the beginning of kind of what I'm doing today. Right. So I, you know, seek God for your answers, man. Seek God for your journey, mm. and that that will change everything else you're doing. What everybody else is competing with, what they're thinking just on surface, mm. they're missing the entire right. thing. Right. So, man, 
I appreciate that one right there. Uh, that's a little sermon right there. Hey, I'm sorry, man. I, like I said, I preach it. <laughs> so I apologize. <laughs> yeah, but I'm hardwired. That's why I, you know, the people who know me know this. Is, you get both with me. So, nah, I think no. So, so fast forward. Uh, you lost 30. I, I'll jump ahead. Uh, basically, uh, you get with Mr. Tiff. Uh, your, your resume is good. You have a great two hour conversation. Uh, and from there, where where does it go? Man, we, I mean, Tiff and I uh, were not just the best of friends. He was more like a father to me. Mm. Um, he was a mentor, taught me the real estate business. Somebody who I, you know, loved dearly. His pictures on the wall here as well. Pictures there. Um, he was, I tell people, he was my branch Ricky. He put me in the game. Yeah. Um, and so I'm very grateful for him. He died this year. Mm. He was 94, wow. 94 years old, had a good life. Yeah. Uh, like towards the end, he had um, Alzheimer's. Mm. And so probably the last couple of years, he didn't know who I was. Mm. He knew me, but he couldn't, didn't know who I was. Yeah. And they had pictures of me in his house. Mm. And his wife would say, Mr. Tiff, that's Dallas, Dallas. And he, he'd look at the picture, he'd look at me, and he, he'd just smile. Uh -huh. And uh, but it was kind of tough to see that. It's kind of like seeing Superman, you know, lose his power. Yeah. Yeah. But me and this dude, man, we played tennis on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We chased women. Uh, I mean, we yeah, he was single, I was single. You know, yeah. Yeah. he's fifty five, I was twenty. But you know, we do. We yeah, that was my dude, man. Yeah. yeah. So, so, but he's also a testament to how people can change mm -hmm. too, because his his father was the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. The Mm -hmm. uh, so imagine being raised by that guy and then hiring this guy, right? right. Uh, to me, it's a testament in terms of how people can really change mm -hmm. if you allow them to meet you. Yeah. Not a representative, right? But really meet you. Yeah. Uh, like when you show up, you need to be you because right. at the end of the day, people are going to like me or not like me. They should like the real thing or mm -hmm. dislike the real thing, right? That's a fact. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, when you're young, you're trying to fit in with everybody. You know, everybody wearing Jordans, you want Jordans. Everybody yeah. wearing this, you want. You yeah. trying to fit in, but mm -hmm. at a certain point, you realize mm -hmm. God didn't call you to fit in. Right. He He called you to do what He called you to do. And I, what I explain to people: Have you ever given thought to the fact that your fingerprints are totally different than mine? Mm -hmm. That people across the planet have different fingerprints. Yeah. I like to think, this is not scripturally support, but this is Dallas, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> that God's put that mark upon you, mm -hmm. that mark of, of uniqueness, mm -hmm. the mark of originality, the mm -hmm. mark of only you can do this. Like, right. you know, only phones now, man, you can, you got the fingerprint joint. Uh -huh. I open this phone. Yeah. And there's certain things that only you gonna be able to touch and you open because God wired you that way since you were in your mother's womb to right. do such. Yeah. So when you think about the whole idea of trying to fit in, it's yeah. counterintuitive to what how God made us. Right. He made us this way. He made us to be leaders, to come into our callings, to do the things that we've been called to do. Yeah. So I'm real clear on what my calling is. I'm real clear that I'm supposed to be, bring people into this real estate business who look like me. Right. I'm real clear on that. Now, that's not to... to to exclude anybody who doesn't look like us to want yeah. to come work with us. Because mm -hmm. any race, yeah. I welcome. I welcome. Yeah. But the reality is simply this. Mm -hmm. White people are not trying to come to T.L. Smith and Company. That's, that's, that's just the reality. Yeah, that's a fact, yeah. So I, I, I got to deal with my reality. I'm, yeah. I'm not going to tend to be people who look like me, who, who call me, reach out to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm perfectly fine with that. I did I, Early on, I wasn't. I thought that was something weird. Yeah. But again, I, I didn't understand. I wasn't clear on what my calling was. Right. I don't really clear on what my calling is now. And, and so, even staying on that, uh, as we get close to the end, I remember we talked, and you talked about uh, as you started uh, your own own business, uh, how important it was to like focus on one thing. Yeah. So, and a lot of times we get messed up on trying to do all these other things and, and and try to specialize in all these other areas instead of focusing on one thing. So can you talk about that and, and kind of how that led to the business and, and what you're doing now? Yeah, absolutely. So two things. I leave Cushman. I mean, I'm sorry. I leave 
Mr. Tiff, and I go to work for Cushman and Wakefield yeah. in 1989. I'm the first black broker working for them. Yeah. And at the time, I originally came in just doing industrial because that's the bulk of where I made my money with Mr. Tiff was industrial. Yeah. Uh, was there for six years, uh, got brought in on this deal. Yeah. They made my eyes open to say, okay, this is how it's going to go down in this town. Uh-huh. I'm going to get called when I absolutely positively got to call me when they need some color on the deal, whatever. Uh-huh. All right. So I'm saying to myself, who's that dude in this town? Mm-hmm. And that was Herman Russell, hands down. Mm-hmm. If 10 deals happened in the town, Herman was going to be on nine of them. <laughs> yeah. So and Herman was also the very first cold call I made when I was at, at Cushman Wakefield. Yeah. And uh, long story short, we became uh, good friends. He was a mentor of mine. Mm-hmm. I was a pallbearer for him. I was the only non family pallbearer at his funeral. Wow. Just like I was a pallbearer at Mr. Tip's funeral just recently. Uh, but I learned a lot from him. But the one thing I always say about Herman, what people really miss, mm-hmm. Herman started his company as a plasterer. Mm-hmm. Before there was sheetrock, there was a thing called plaster. Mm-hmm. You put, like chicken wire, and you put yeah. like this stuff over it, and yeah. you make a wall. So he was a master plaster by the time he was eight, nine years old. Because mm-hmm. his father did the same thing. Yeah. But he grew that company from being a plastering company to mm-hmm. the largest African-American-owned construction company in the U.S., Wow. So what he started with one seed grew into this bigger thing. Mm-hmm. So it goes to your question. When I started T. Dallas Smith and Company, uh, a lot of people who looked like us were doing full service mm-hmm. company. Yeah. So they were doing everything. I, mean, <laughs> I, I, I visited a couple of folks I won't name. But they had offerings. I'm telling you, was this thing all yeah. the stuff they would do? And I'm saying, well, where, where, where are all your people? <laughs> like, it's, it's you know, it's me and Charles. I'm like, yeah. You and Charles doing all of this? Like, it's hard to believe, but I'm like, okay. Um, but, you know, also the power of being broke. You know, uh, Damon John has a book called yeah. The Power of Broke. Uh, I was broke, right? Yeah. When I started for, I mean, broke, broke. So yeah. I couldn't have a full service firm if I wanted to. Because right. if I wanted to, like, if I had 10 listings out here, yeah. right, that means I got to have at least 10 signs. Uh-huh. Signs, commercial signs cost around $400, $500 mm-hmm. at the time. Yeah. So hell, man. I mean, that's that's four thousand, five thousand dollars. I do not have. Right. So if I stay with just tenant rep, mm-hmm. I don't need to sign for you. Mm-hmm. All I need is a, to be able to print out a, a letter of a, a, a letter of opportunity, a letter of authorization. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. LOA, so mm-hmm. a letter of authorization for you to hire me, mm-hmm. and I can do that on any credit. Yeah, right. And so it was really a singularly focused on tenant representation. Mm-hmm that has made us now the largest African-American tenant rep firm in the country, mm. period. Yeah. So, but I wonder if I had all the money in the world to do whatever I wanted to do, what that might look like. Mm. I would say to you, it's probably, we wouldn't be where we are today. Mm. Yeah, but I'm real clear on, again, what God's mission was for me right. too. And he said, enlarge the tent. Now mind you, all this is happening. This company started, was the idea was birthed December, 2006. Mm-hmm. Oh, if, it went, if it wasn't for those broke times, mm-hmm. I wouldn't have been singularly focused. Yeah. Oh, we're going to make it work with this. Right. And uh, we had our eyes set on two clients, yeah. AT&T and the federal government. Mm-hmm. And we end up getting AT&T. It's kind of, in fact, our, our oldest corporate client, we've had them for more than 12 years. Yeah. Uh, and the GSA work, we just we decided the federal government stuff was yeah. not for us. <laughs> <All right. laughs> it's like, you talking about a brain trust yeah. issue that it just do. Yeah. It wasn't for us. Man. Uh, but, you know, we just put our sights on what we wanted. And, yeah. I mean, just about every name that we had on our list that we targeted went after we got. Man. And, and, and so uh, two more things before, before we wrap up. Um, <clears throat> this idea of, um, and we, we skip past a, a lot of things, but one thing uh, that I do know for sure, just because, from talking to you and knowing your story, mm-hmm. there were some hard times. There were some oh, times. Yeah. <laughs> there were definitely oh, some. Oh, yeah. 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 And you and I know a lot of times you talk about embrace and em, embracing pain. So can yeah. you speak to that? Uh, because a lot of people, you know, I watch interviews and we talk, yeah. they talk to people like you, and it's just all up and up, and it just yeah, up, man. Up, hey, dude. Let's, be, let's be clear, it went all up and up. And yeah. so you gotta look at pain this way. Uh, I mean, you if you work out, you if you run, you lift weights, whatever. If you're not getting pain, you're not gonna see any difference. There won't be any change. Right. It just won't. Mm-hmm. And the other thing I would say to you is, the minute you know what you've been called to do, mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. It's the same time the enemy knows what you've been called to do. Mm. So the enemy's job is to stop you from doing what you're supposed to do. <laughs> I mean, just think if the enemy was to stop Dr. King from doing what he was supposed to do, Man. what would we be today? Man. You know what I'm saying? So, and I'm not comparing myself to Dr. King, but I'm saying I'm like he was called to do something. Right. I'm called to do something. Right. And I, I I guarantee you, you called to do something. Right. Everybody, every human being on this planet is called to do something. Right. And I think our life's journey should really be to what is that? Mm-hmm. I was very fortunate to find out what I was supposed to do. Now, mind you, I've been in this business 40 years, but I've only been in my calling 16. Because mm-hmm. that's when I met Leonte Benton, mm-hmm. a young black man who was a Southport Morehouse, mm-hmm. trying to figure his way out, wanted to get into commercial real estate. Mm-hmm. I told him, get his license, we'll talk. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I said that to 50 people over the years. Nobody ever came back. So mm-hmm. I was expecting him to do the same thing and disappear. Uh, but this kid went out and got his license in three weeks yeah. <laughs> over a Christmas holiday. Yeah. And came back and said, Miss Smith, I got the license. And I'm like, oh, hell, what I'm going to do with this kid? So I'm trying to get rid of him for two weeks. Uh And then I have this epiphany. And God's like, Dallas, that was you when you're trying to get into the real estate business. Mm -hmm. But there was nobody who looked like you who could help you. Uh You can help this young man unlike anybody was ever able to help you. Mm -hmm. And it was literally at that moment, at that time, when I realized what God had called me to do. And Mm -hmm. all these things, these journeys I've gone through was for this thing that I'm doing now. Right. And so now, you know, we've got almost 20 brokers over here now. Mm-hmm. Uh, diverse backgrounds, mm-hmm. very sharp folks. We got some smart folks over here, man. I mean, we got a we yeah. got a healthy dream team who can yeah. really make stuff happen. So, 2020, we did the largest transaction in the United States. Yeah, 523,000 square feet for Microsoft. Dude, this I mean, it, this is the same firm that started off with nothing. I'm talking about we talk about hard times. Yeah, try and go shopping at the grocery <laughs> store with twenty dollars in your pocket. <laughs> I'm not both. Yeah. Twenty dollars in your pocket. Yeah. Man, I'm in that. I'm in that, and I got a wife and a child. Man, I'm, I'm in the cat. I'm in the line going like, okay, if I get this, that's all right. Dude, I, I had a ten k, ten k, figuring out to the penny with that. <laughs> then you get up there, hand the twenty dollars bill. It takes, by the way, it takes about an hour and a half to shop for twenty dollars. <laughs> you know, when you have money, you don't think about you just throw stuff in the basket. You don't have to yeah. But when you got twenty dollars, you gotta take your it. Money, you can't do it. That, that's one thing. And the other thing I found out that they don't do this now, but back in the day, mm-hmm. uh, I, I, I was so broke. I didn't have money to go pick up a check. Oh, man. I didn't have any gas. Yeah. And so I said, man, I mean, the light is on. I mean, it's this joint. Mm-hmm. I'm supposed to go to Africa to pick up a check. For yeah. I, was <laughs> I said, man, I think I got like $10. And uh, so I had like maybe $4 or something like that in the bank account. This is, no, mm-hmm. this is a true story. Man. So I go put the credit card in the gas yeah. thing, thinking, okay, man, I, it'll stop at $4. Yeah. You know, that's all I got in there. Uh, $4 hopefully enough to get me out there. I get checked, and I'll be good. You'll be good, yeah. Man, I'm pumping, man. And it gets past four, it goes five, six. I'm like, oh. <laughs> now I'm like, oh, man, let me go fill this thing up. So I went ahead and fill the tank up. Because back then, they had a two-day delay on yeah. the gas pump. So if you bought it on a Monday, it wasn't going to come out of your account till yeah. Wednesday. Uh, now, how do I know that? I know that because I was broke. And if I hadn't been broke, I would have known that. So I used those two days of grace period to make that happen. You know? So it's the things that you have to get creative with when, you, when you're broke. Uh, uh, but I tell you, man, there's no limit to what God can do with very little. Yeah, I, t- I tell my wife all the time, I said, now, don't you want to be able to hear from God Kind of guy I tell you go to the go to the pond, pull a fish out, uh-huh. reach in his mouth, take the gold out, go pay our taxes. Uh-huh. That's what he told his disciples. Yeah. So the, the 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 thing is, our antennas have to be really clear in order to hear what God's telling yeah. us to do. Right. Because I'm telling you what he's telling you to do, Juan, it's not the same thing he's telling me. Right. And I think that's the thing where we get we get tripped up because mm-hmm. yeah, I'm gonna try to tell you my mission. Well, you need to be doing this. Again, somebody got saved June second, nineteen eighty seven. Uh, I know how the church can really bombard you in a way yeah. that you're supposed to conform in a certain way, but I'm here to tell you, yeah, God's called you to do something, yeah, to impact the kingdom. Right. It's not just the other way around. It's not just for the kingdom to impact you. It's mm-hmm. for you to come and help impact the kingdom. Man, man, man. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna. Uh, your new name is Bishop, not the church <laughs> no more. This is Bishop. Uh, <laughs> the cussing bishop, Dallas. <laughs> Man, uh, so last last thing. Um, number well, it's a two part question. Uh, part one is, uh, you know, what's next for you and the company? Um, yeah. as, you, as you guys keep going, and then 
uh, part two, we have this uh, thing on the show. Uh, the show was named after or inspired by Jay-Z, one of my favorite artists, uh, this idea of the blueprint. Um, and so uh, I asked the guests if you could name your album of your life right now, what would you name it? So a two-part question. Where are you going and what would you name your album? The album, let me give you the album cover first. The album name is In the Black. In the Black. Hand, hands down, In the yeah. Black. In the Black is the only place in the dictionary where black is actually a positive. <laughs> yeah. you know, every, if you want to be in the black, which means financially solid, right? Yeah. Everybody wants to be in the black. Yeah. So yeah. it would be in the black. Okay. And it's about twofold, how to be positive in, f- from a financial standpoint, but also how to diversify mm. the folks in your own company. Mm. And if you do that, your company will be in the black on both ways. Wow. So in the black is the name. I like that. I like the album, that. right? Okay. Uh, what was the other part? <laughs> the other, other part. What, what are we doing next? So, so August uh, of this year, uh, Leonte will actually become president of the company. Mm. And why? Because that's what God told me when I first started the company. Yeah. He said, you know, by the time when I turned 60, yeah. um, f- first of all, train him up as a son, mm. teach him the good, bad, and ugly of everything you've done in this business. So yeah. Leonte knows everything I've done in this business and so if he wanted to write an expose about me, he could. Uh, but I've been raising him as a son, as God asked me to do. So the idea, my August twenty third is my birthday. I turn sixty. Lord, again, Lord willing, the creek don't rise. Yeah. Leonte will become president of the company. He'll be responsible for the brokerage company, mm-hmm. um, and still the leaders, the leadership team: Dexter Warrior, um, Cedric Metheny, Corey Ferguson. Mm-hmm. And Audra Cunningham, that's the leadership team as it stands today, mm-hmm. uh, will be running the broker stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm working on some stuff, but I'll still be CEO and founder of the company. Mm-hmm. But I'm working on acquiring assets and building assets uh, mm-hmm. on the development side for mm-hmm. the firm. Yeah. So the idea is that we both balance both things. The mm-hmm. things that we're doing in terms of ownership mm-hmm. won't conflict with the clients that we're representing. Right. Uh, but it'll also be a vehicle, yeah. if you will, for the brokers, the brokers to be able to invest in tangible assets. Mm-hmm. So they really have a true retirement and that kind of thing where people they're making money when they're not working anymore. So that's I, I'm, I'm so I'm starting that from scratch, uh, yeah. the same way I did two dollars spend the company. Yeah. But uh, that's what I'm going to be doing. Still um, responsible for sort of. Uh, being sort of the problem solver, and if you will, in some form, uh, with some of the companies that we represent, some of our legacy companies who mm. I've always dealt with, you know, the heads of real estate and that kind of thing. I'll still continue to do that, mm. and uh, spend a lot more time on the golf course yeah. uh, with those with those same people who love to play golf as well. Yeah. Uh, but that's kind of the future, man. I'm excited, man. We got a very strong team. Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's you know it's going good when you can sit in the meeting and you don't have to say a word. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so that's I'm, that's what I'm very proud about this group, man. We've got some great, great clients that we're dealing with now, some stuff that's going to come out soon, being revealed, some, <laughs> some bigger uh, assignments that we're closing up. Yeah. Um, you know, people will be surprised at what this little firm can do. Yeah. Man, man, I'm looking forward to it. And, and uh, that development definitely sounds interesting to me. So I'll definitely reach out to you. All right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, later on. Um, so I, again, man, I appreciate you. I want to respect your time. Uh, I, I got. I'll be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Audra Cunningham because she's the one who first connected me with you, uh, yeah. trying to get in commercial real estate. Uh, and we're, we got. I'm trying to get both of them on here, but Leonte, uh, we scheduled for in a couple of weeks. So okay, I'm gonna ask him his side of the story, and we'll really yeah, have yeah, yeah. I, I might have to be in the background listening <laughs> to that. Right. <laughs> but yeah, but thanks again. I, I really appreciate you. Uh, uh, I don't think you know how much you inspire me and how much I appreciate our conversations. Um, oh, and thank you. I really appreciate it. Hey, man. Keep doing what you're doing, bro. Keep yes, doing.